I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of John, Gospel of John, chapter 15 is our text this evening. Uh, and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1071, and you'll find John chapter 15. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you need one, you want one, then please take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, uh, I'm going to ask for just a, a little bit of, uh, I guess I could use the word sympathy or prayers or whatever. I've been sick all week. And uh, I, I haven't really been speaking to anyone for about four days, uh, so I'm not sure what my voice is going to do tonight. So it, it may cut out halfway through, it may squawk a little bit, uh, and, or I may just pause and take a drink, and, and I'm hoping that it shows up tomorrow as well. So uh, if not, they're going to get the, this service uh, on, uh, on tape. So uh, if I'm, hey, hey, if you're watching this tomorrow morning, then, uh, you know, guess what happened? So anyway, uh, I, would, I would appreciate that, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I just, uh, we'll, we'll just we'll not talk about it if I make weird noises, because uh, it just stops. Hey, uh, let me tell you about something I'm really excited about uh, as we launch into this message. Uh, it is a month away from Calvary's launch of two new campuses. Uh, in January, first weekend in January, we're going to be launching a Parker campus, uh, 11 o'clock worship at the Parker High School, and we're going to be launching uh, the McCulloch campus. And if you're new here and you don't know what the McCulloch campus is, that's our original campus. It's about a mile and a half from here, 1605 South McCulloch. And we're going to be launching what we're going to call Calvary Unplugged Worship uh, over there at 930 and 11 on Sundays. And I know this is Saturday evening, and so maybe you uh, aren't really, you don't really care about that. But we're doing this because the mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And uh, we're running out of places to put people. Uh, and, and I'm just sharing that with you because right now, Saturday night, it's got a few seats open, but it's comfortably full in here. Uh, Sunday mornings are much more compact uh, and challenged for seats. And so we're going we're gonna to be asking about two to 300 people to move over to McCulloch. Uh, we think some of you will like it better there. Joseph Pfeiffer is going to be our primary worship leader at McCulloch. And so uh, I just want to challenge you to start praying about it. Now, Saturday night, you guys are like, hey, we're good with Saturday night service. We're not going over there on Sunday morning. We're going to need people to serve. So just pray about it, okay? Just going to challenge you that way. And if God leads you that way to be a part of that service, uh, whether it's to attend or to serve, then I'm going to encourage you to listen to God at that point. Hey, we're talking about uh, our core values and, and why we do what we do here at Calvary. Tonight we're talking about connection. And our relationships define almost everything about us. You thought about that? Our relationships. Think about it. When you're a child, uh, people ask you, who are your parents? You know, who are your siblings? Uh, who's your family? Uh, when you get a little bit older, then again, relationships define you. You know, are you in a relationship? Are you married? Are you dating? Are you divorced? Are you widowed? Are you seeing someone? You know, uh, and then you get to that point where they go, do you have children or grandchildren? And then, you know, and grandchildren, you're like, oh, yeah, let me show them to you, right? <laughs> pull out your phone now. Some of you remember the days when people pull out their wallet and they had those fold-out pictures. <laughs> yeah, and then you were only, you know, uh, you know, had to look at like, 15 or 20 pictures, now people can show you literally thousands of them on their phone, and you can't escape. So you got to be careful when you ask that question. Do you have grandchildren? Yes, I do. You want to see pictures? No, I don't. Uh, the, uh, so, you know, but it goes beyond just our family relationships. Uh, think about it. Relationships define you. What country are you from? What company or business do you work for? Do you have your own business? What do you do? Those are uh, relationship things. What team do you root for, even if they're bad? <laughs> hey, right now, the Cardinals are number one in line for the draft. Uh, so uh, <laughs> at, at, uh, the first will be last, and the last will be first for some things. So, uh, you know, but what political party do you belong to? What civic group did you join? What church do you attend? See, relationships define so much about us, and that's why connection is one of our core values, because life change happens when people connect through relationships. 
And we believe there are three relationships that every single person needs to have a full and complete life. Three relationships. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight is those three aspects of connection. Number one, we got to connect with God. We need to connect with God. Everyone needs to connect with God. That's uh, our conviction. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Hey, I'm going to encourage you to go home and, and read John chapter 15 because the whole chapter is about fruitfulness and about how God wants to bless us. But let me just use verse 5 because it's kind of the, the one that holds the entire chapter together. Jesus says, look, I want you to understand the relationship here. I'm the vine. I'm the one who gives life. I'm the one who has roots. I'm the vine. You are connected to me. Like branches are connected to a vine. And if you remain in me, then I'll remain in you, and you're going to bear much fruit. You're going to have a fruitful life. But apart from me, if you detach from me, what can you do? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. There's not going to be fruitfulness. So if you're connected with Jesus, you're going to have a fruitful life. If you're disconnected or unconnected, you're going to be helpless. You're going to have a fruitless life. So... This, this connection piece begins when we connect with God by committing to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, if you want to look one chapter earlier in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says this is how you connect to God is through Jesus Christ. So I just want to begin by asking, have you experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? Because that's the only biblical way that we can really connect with our creator God. And I know there's lots of people who want to talk about, well, you know, I want to go connect with God. And, and, and we're living in a time when people are spiritual in all kinds of different ways. And they'll talk about all kinds of different things. And that's a, that's a great problem to have. Because if people are spiritual, we can talk to them about the spirit that lives in us. We can talk to them about our relationship with God that is personal. It's not ambiguous. It's not kind of you wonder about it. This is real, and it happens with Jesus. And it begins when we acknowledge, when we confess that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. And we believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, and it is personal. And we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, physically, literally raised from the dead, and everyone who commits their life to following Jesus has eternal life. And, and if you're here tonight and you haven't yet done that, and now understand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about you haven't joined a church or you haven't been baptized or you haven't, you know, taken an intro class or anything. I'm talking about you know and God knows your heart and whether or not you have surrendered to him. Scripture says that his spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness in us that we are sons and daughters of God. And so if you're, if you're here and there's any question about it, there's any confusion, do one of two things. Number one, you can just bow your head where you're at right now and say, God, I need you to change my life. I surrender to you. Okay, done. Or you can you know, find one of us after the service, pastors at the Connection Centers, members of our prayer team down front. They would love to share with you how you can know that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is going to lead to heaven when you die, that is going to make your life fruitful. So if you haven't done that, honestly, what are you waiting for? I mean, really, honestly, what, what is it that's preventing you from making that commitment to follow Jesus? Because we want you to make that commitment. We're all about uh, connecting people to Jesus. Connection is one of our core values. So if you are a follower... And you're going, yes, I know that I've experienced this life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. I know he's my Savior. I know my sins are forgiven. I know that. Then how intentional are you to connect with God daily? I mean, you have that life-changing connection. The Holy Spirit's in you, so you're connected. But, but how intentional are you to nurture that connection, to make sure it's strong through daily prayer, through Bible reading, through serving, through fellowship, through all those different kinds of things that are part of building that connection and keeping it strong. I guess in other words, is your relationship with Jesus a priority 
or an afterthought. Because our first necessary connection is with God. It's the most important connection in your life. Now, our second connection is that we need to connect with the body of Christ. We need to connect with the body of Christ. The church is what we're talking about. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Did you catch that? We're we're many members, but we're one body in Christ. And every one of us is a part of this body of Christ. Every one of us is important and significant to the body of Christ. So, So I want you to hear this again. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are instrumental and significant to the body of Christ. You're important. To Jesus' body. You're important to the church. You're not just somebody who comes in and sits in a seat and then leaves and and doesn't matter. Now, that may be your pattern, but I want you to understand that in the scheme of things, the body of Christ, you are important to the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is important to you. Now, I know um, we already read it, but think back to what we read just a few moments ago. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you're going to bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. And one of the things that is happening across our, our land, and, and lots of people, lots of people you know, maybe sometimes you think that, and that is this. I hear people tell me all the time when I invite them to church, you know, I love God, I believe in Jesus, I don't need church. I love God, I believe in Jesus, I don't need to go to church. And, and technically, you do not need to go to church in order to have eternal life from Jesus Christ. That is absolutely true. We're saved by grace. It's not by what we do. We're saved by the gift that comes from God. But I want you to think about this and how ridiculous that statement is in in the scheme of things. Because what they're saying, in essence, is I love Jesus, but I don't like his bride. I love Jesus, but I don't like his wife. So let me just ask you this. If someone said to you, you personally, hey, you know, I really like hanging out with you. In fact, I want to be best friends with you. I want to share everything with you. And and I want you to mentor me and teach me. But I don't like your spouse. I don't like your significant other. Uh, So they're not really welcome to hang out with us. How are you going to respond? I mean, honestly, how are you going to respond? Because I'll tell you how I would respond. People who want to hang out with me, uh, they need to understand the garrisons are a package deal. You know, that's just how it works. I mean, so if, you know, you say, hey, I I really like you, but I don't want to, you know, hang out with your wife. I want to hang out with you. I want us to be best buds. I want us to do stuff together. I'm just going to be like, "Eh, it's not going to happen. It's really not going to happen. Now, look, if you you don't, you know, that's the way you want to do it, look, I'll still preach to you. I'll teach you. I'll pray for you. If you're sick, I'll pray for you. If you die, I'll do your funeral. I'll say nice things. Uh, (laughs) But we're not going to be close. We're just not. I kind of think it's like that with Jesus. I mean, Jesus loves his bride like crazy. Uh, In fact, he uses his love for his bride as the example of how men are supposed to love their wives. In Ephesians 5, uh, the Apostle Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus loved the church enough to die for the church. So tell me, do you really think you're going to make points with Jesus by going, Jesus, I love you, but your bride sucks. (laughs) Yeah, you know what? Jesus is still going to love you. He's still going to teach you. He's still going to bless you. But you're not going to be close. You're not going to be close. You can can deceive yourself if you want to, but... But he made us to connect with his body, and he saved us to connect with his body. That's the reality of the church. And so at Calvary, we we offer two primary ways that we encourage you to connect. Uh, The first way, the primary way, the, the one you hear about all the time is life groups. 
Might have heard us mention life groups. Sign ups begin tonight. You can sign up for a life group tonight. If you're not in a life group, we want you to be in a life group because this is the foundational way we want every single adult at Calvary to connect. We're talking about small groups so that you have deep relationships with other believers with encouragement and accountability. Because reality is we all need good friends around us, don't we? I mean, anybody want bad friends around them? See, we want good friends around us, and Scripture affirms that. 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company is going to lead good morals astray. You might think, well, I'm going to hang out with all my, my uh, reprobate friends, and they're going to be who I surround myself with, and, and uh, eventually they're going to lead you astray. You need to be in fellowship. Uh, Proverbs puts it the positive way. Proverbs says, the one who walks with the wise becomes wise. Of course, the flip side of that is if you hang out with idiots, <laughs> you, can, you can figure out the rest. So can I just tell you my life group has been life-changing for Merelda and I? I mean, we love our life group. We fellowship with our life group. That's a church word for party, by the way. Uh, we serve together. We play together. Uh, and we, I just believe everyone needs a life group. Uh, and, and that's why this is one of the things that is foundational to Calvary. And that's why we encourage you to sign up and join a life group. And that's why we always need leaders and hosts. And, and so can I just say this? If, uh, if you need to sign up for a life group, stop by this life group table. It's right out the front doors to your right. And, and sign up tonight. But there's some of you sitting here that uh, have experienced leading life groups or think, you know what, I, I could lead a life group. And you know, you're absolutely right, you could. And you need to talk to Mike Wilkinson out at the table or you need to email him at lifegroups at calvarylhc.com and, and let him know you're interested in leading or hosting a life group because we're always looking for leaders and hosts of life groups so that we can continue to add more people to life groups. And some of you right now, the Spirit is nudging you and you need to listen to him and just go ahead and do that uh, and, and don't put it off because that's what Satan wants you to do. So here's the thing. Some of you are going, yeah, 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 you're the pastor, so you're supposed to promote life groups. Let me share some stories, some, some testimonials from people who are in life groups. So Denise writes, I was an isolator for the majority of my life. Then in 2000, God blessed me with a friend who became as close as a sister. Fast forward to my husband's and mine moved to Lake Havasu in 2012, and I began to isolate myself again. Until in 2013, God convicted me that I needed to be in fellowship with other believers. He led me to Calvary where I immediately joined the Lucas Life Group, purely in obedience to what I knew God was directing me to do. You can just taste the sarcasm right there. I just did not want to do this, but God told me. Once I joined the group, I was a wallflower for the first year until Pastor Chad gave a message that caused a paradigm shift in my life and that week, I couldn't wait to share with my safe people what God had shown me. One of the co-leaders in the life group says, Denise was joyless, a wonderful Christian woman, but no joy in her life. She came to life group late, left early, didn't share much. After one sermon about joy, she arrived on time, opened up, and stayed for snack fellowship. And we haven't been able to shut her up since. <clears throat> Dennis... Uh, writes, or, or uh, his wife writes, Dennis had guilt that he couldn't let go of. Uh, one life group night, he said, if I were God, I wouldn't forgive me. And one of the members of the life group at the time, Lloyd Ames, said, Dennis, that's the point. You aren't God. <laughs> the light bulb went off, and he's finally forgiven himself after 45 years. Joe and Katrina write, life group changed our lives from, obviously Katrina's writing this, from me going to church by myself with our children to leading a life group in our home. One night, Joe agreed to attend a life group, and they went to Scott and Chris Horton's life group. Things began to connect for Joe, and he asked Katrina if she would take him to church. They did, and things took off from there. Joe is now a committed Christian and trying his best to live as a Christian husband and father. And this summer, when things weren't going so well between he and Katrina, he asked uh, to kind of back out of life group leadership. But he quickly changed his mind, and he called back and said, 
the enemy is not going to get another victory, and they would continue to work on their marriage, and they would continue to run a life group. See? I just want you to know, life group is one of our primary paths to life change, and that's why we want you in a life group. And, and, and what I hope happens is there's so many of you that go out and try to sign up for life groups that we don't have enough life groups for you. And some of you that are like God's really calling to be leaders go, all right, God, you're, you're doing this. Let's, let's step into the miracle. We got a month to get ready for this before we kick off the next season of life groups. So there's plenty of time uh, to make this all happen. Now, the other primary way to connect with the body at Calvary is serving. Serving. Now, being part of a ministry team that is working together on a regular basis to advance the cause of Christ causes people to connect in ways that are significant. Because when you're, you know, helping to lead others to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, it makes all the difference. And we have so many ways that you can serve. I mean, we've got first impressions. Do you guys get harassed by first impressions on your way in tonight? That's what we call our greeters. They're, they're our first impressions team. And, and so uh, I actually was talking to somebody who doesn't go to church, but uh, who had visited, and, and kind of, they're, they're an extreme introvert, and they said, yeah, your greeters annoyed me. <laughs> I said, we trained them to do that. <laughs> and, uh, and she actually, you know, suggested that maybe we ha should have an introvert entrance where we're not, you don't have to get, you know, greeted and hugged on the way in. And I said, you know, I never thought about that, but uh, that's interesting. I said, would you come if we did that? And she didn't promise. So, uh, but first impressions, we've got worship arts, we've got children's ministry, we have our tech team, student ministry. All of these and more are an excellent way to build close relationships with like-minded servants who love people and, and want to provide that encouragement and accountability to one another as we serve God. And I know some of you are thinking, yeah, but you guys got lots of volunteers. You don't need me. Did I mention that we're opening two new campuses uh, in a month? So you might be sitting there thinking, I'm not really needed around here. And the, the truth is, you are. Because there's so many opportunities to serve and so many ways that we can put you to, to work. Uh, and, and here's the thing. We don't just want you to do something. Well, I mean, we do. if you're not doing anything, we do would like you to do something. Truthfully. But we don't just want you to do something. We want you to do something that God has laid on your heart, that God's given you a passion for. Now, if God's given you a passion to sing and you're no good at it, we're going to tell you, okay? But... Uh, <laughs> Because some of you are going to be like, I want to sing, and you never watched American Idol tryouts. So uh, uh, we're also full of truth here, uh, as well as grace. But, uh, but how are you connected with the body of, uh, of Christ at Calvary? I mean, if this is your church, then how are you connecting? Uh, because that is significance. Life change happens in that context of relationships. So we start with connecting with God and then we connect with the body of Christ. And finally, we connect with the unchurched. Connect with the unchurched. Words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are the salt of the earth. He's talking to his followers, his disciples. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You see, Jesus is telling his followers that he expects us to connect with people who are far from God so that we can flavor their lives with Jesus. He wants us, his followers, to connect with people who are far from God so that we can flavor their lives with the gospel. So that we're able to, to influence them for the kingdom so we can share with them the hope of life change that we've experienced. I mean, that's kind of the mission part of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, but that's part of connection. And it's part of connections because uh, it's radically different than how many of us were raised in church. I mean, I was raised as a good church kid slash Pharisee, okay? Churches I went to, you know, they, uh, they really didn't want you to have anything to do with people who are far from God unless you were witnessing at them. You know what I'm talking about? Witnessing at people. We're not where you have any kind of relationship, but you're just talking at them, telling them how they need to change their life, even though you don't know who they are or anything about them. And, and so, yeah, you know, that really didn't, doesn't, didn't fit with this because they didn't want you to hang out with those reprobates, those evil people, because they'd lead you astray. And here's the problem. 
salt is useless if it doesn't touch your food. Okay, how many of you like salt? Go ahead. Lots of you like salt. Okay, so uh, does it help when you sit down and you get your food uh, to put the salt near the food? No. Salt shaker there by your plate doesn't really influence it at all, does it? No. And, and have you ever just done this? Uh, have you ever, you know, invited the food to go get the salt at once on it? Because that's what a lot of churches do, right? That's part of their strategy. Hey, well, you know, they're, if they're looking for God, we're here. They can come on in and get salted. No. If you want your food to be salted, what do you have to do? You have to make the salt touch the food, right? That's where that, that power of change happens. That's where the flavor uh, change happens is when there is connection, when it touches the, the food. So, so here's the thing. How are we going to be salt to an unchurched world? Seriously, how are we going to be salt to an unchurched world? Uh, I'm just going to show you our strategy. It's pretty simple. Uh, the first part of it is through natural relationships. Natural relationships. Who are the people that you're already touching with your life? Who are the people that you're already in relationship with that you know? We're talking about your family. Your family members. We're talking about your friends. Your coworkers, your acquaintances, those people that you see, you know, in and out during the week on a regular basis. How are you impacting them? Because what we really want you to do is to, you know, have them see your life because they know your life and you have credibility with them. See, a lot of people used to tell me, I'll tell, oh, pastor, I want you to meet my friends. <laughs> and I would tell them, your friends don't care about me. Unless they're church people, they don't care about me. I mean, most unchurched people, they don't, they don't care about a pastor. In fact, pastors are just kind of like a, you know, let's go to a museum and look at one, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing. Let's go to a pastor exhibit and see what they're like, because they're not real. And, and I've got no credibility with your unchurched friends, but you do. They see your life. They know your life. They, they, they've seen how God has impacted your life. Now, that is kind of the caveat. You do have to be kind of like living a, a, the character of Christ talked about that a couple of weeks ago. You have to be living out that character of Christ because if they don't see that life change happening in you, then your credibility is shot too. But if they see that credibility in your life, they see how God is changing your life, they see how God is healing your, your marriage and making your family stronger, they're going to listen to you and they're going to respond to you and when you invite them, they're going to come. So, and, and you're going to be able to share your story. You're going to be able to bring them to church with you because you've got credibility in their lives. And, and right now, I want you to think about the people that you know that, that you have credibility with that would probably come to church if you invited them. Because when you have their trust and you tell your story and you invite them to church, God's going to transform their lives. God's going to change their lives. He's going to, he's going to heal families. He's going to forgive sins. He's going to put people together. It's, it's going to be amazing if you'll look at that and see those natural relationships that God has already given you. But see, here's the, here's the part of this that, that is so wild. To do this, you actually have to believe that God can change somebody's life. See, I, I grew up in churches where they talked about how God had the power to change people's lives, but nobody ever brought their unchurched friends. Ever just didn't happen talked about it from the pulpit talked about the power of God people sat there nodded their heads and said yes God has the power to change lives did they bring lost people no did they bring unchurched people no did they bring people who are way far from God no in fact when you had that conversation with them hey who do you know oh these people would never come they God oh no they'd never believe really so you don't believe that God has the power to change their life So do you believe that God has the power to change people's lives? Amen. See, it's, it's that question that it's easy to answer in church, but the real answer comes in how we live our lives. Are you looking at your, your unchurched family and friends and acquaintances and coworkers and going, hey, you know what? God could change. They really need God to change their life. 
I'm going to try and be salt in their life, and I'm going to go ahead and invite them. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and encourage them. I'm going to ask them, you know, hey, do you go to church? Do you have faith? What do you believe? You want to come find out what we believe? See, if we believe, we invite. If we believe, we invite. If we don't believe, we won't invite. Second part of the strategy is just serving the community. It's serving the community. Now, you know by now, at least I hope you do, that Calvary serves Lake Havasu, and we've already started serving down in Parker. Okay? It's what we do. Um, we did serve our schools. We had over 300 volunteers on 11 campuses this year, uh, just a, a month or so ago. Uh, you guys have filled up and donated about 700 backpacks. I mean, they're all over the place around here, but, and at both campuses. You know, where, where you've, you've sacrificed, you're going to bless like 700 families, many of whom you'll never meet. All the angel trees, things were gone, you know, before we got finished with the services on a weekend. Uh, you guys appreciate teachers and school staff. You, you bless Peach Springs and down on the border and Tijuana and, and all kinds of places. And, and last year, as a church, we gave over $40,000 away to people who are in, in need in our community. See, th this is stuff that matters because this is part of our strategy of what we do. By the way, i got to share this with you, and it's not about the community, but it's about serving. Do you guys realize that through the wells that, that we've done in Mozambique, that as a church, we've directly touched the lives of over 23,000 people with clean water? I, I mean, that number just, I, I was like going, hey, that's, that's kind of cool. And churches have been started, and people are coming to faith. And, uh, and so, you know, that's serving. And, and you, so you know what we do, but what you may not know is why. Why do we do it? Why do we do all those things? Some of you are answering the questions for me. Good deal. You've, you've taken the classes. You've figured this out. But uh, we serve to earn the right to be heard. We serve because we want to earn the right to be heard. We understand that a lot of people have kind of let go of the importance of, of God. They, he's just not important in their lives. And, and we know the way, the truth, and the life. We know Jesus. We have a relationship with Jesus. We want to speak Jesus into their lives. We're going to be the salt. But a lot of people aren't interested in salt. They're kind of living a no-Jesus life, and they don't want to talk about him. And so by serving, we earn the right to have a conversation with them about the love of God, about the transforming power of God, about how he has changed our lives. A lot of you that have served have discovered that because people want to know why. They want to know what's driving us to do this. And then we serve to make it easier for someone to say yes when you invite them. We're, we're greasing the wheels for you to get a yes when you invite one of your friends to, to church. I, I hope you realize that. I, I've had this conversation with people, so I know it happens. And you kind of go, hey, you know, why, do you have a church? No. Want to come to Calvary? Is that that church out on the highway? Yeah. Are you guys the ones that did the, you fill in the blank. Lots of different things. I go, yes, we are. And they go, yeah, you know what, I, I, I've been thinking about coming to visit you guys. Or yeah, you know what, I'd come and hang out with people who care about our community. You see, we're making it easy for them to say yes to you when you invite them. Trying to add to that credibility that you have. And, and the way that you're living out your faith. And then we serve because, let's just face it, this is our community. And it's kind of a Christian thing to be good neighbors. Again, I don't know why the churches that, that I grew up in didn't get this, but... This is where we live. These are the people that we live with. Uh, we're supposed to love our neighbors, and that means that we ought to be good neighbors. We ought to bless our community. We ought to make it a better place to live and to be because by doing that, we're blessing all of the people here in Jesus' name. So how are you connecting with our community? How are you connecting with the unchurched? How are you being salt right now? Life change happens through relationships. First of all, our connection to God, then our connection to the body of Christ, and then to our community. Because there's still about 40,000 people in Lake Havasu City that don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord. So, it comes back to this. Do you want a fruitful life? So, do you want a fruitful life? 
Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Let's connect. Will you pray with me?